So um, I'm going to start our pre-lunch lecture. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank you, everybody here that's present with us. Um, I also want to thank you the presence of Professor Opelt and Professor Higley for accepting our invitation for this event. Um, now I have to present our sponsor, Dr. Luis Hegley. He is going to be the chairman of this lecture uh, and going to do the further presentations. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so thank you, Rafaela. Uh, bom, bom dia. Eu vou, vou estar aqui, então. Eu vou ser o, o chairman, né? Uh, dessa, fazer essa introdução é, em português, né? E depois eu vou fazer essa introdução em inglês, tá? É, só só para a gente deixar claro como a gente vai fazer a. a a temática né, da nossa, dessa palestra do professor Opelt. É, a gente vai é, colocar todas as perguntas no final, tá? É, essas perguntas poderão ser feitas via chat ou pelo microfone no final. É, as perguntas poderão ser feitas tá, em português ou em inglês e a palestra será feita pelo professor Opelt em inglês, tá bem? Uh, então, agora a gente prossegue, uh, eu vou prosseguir então com introdução em inglês, para que o professor Opel também nos entenda, né, e, com, e então a gente continua dando o segmento, né, a essa palestra. So, uh, uh, eu vou, mas primeiro eu vou dar uma introdução em português uh, da, da, da biografia dele, tá, o professor Opel uh, possui, então, um doutorado, né, PhD pela Universidade de Hanover, na Alemanha, ele atua como professor em High Performance Drilling and Automation, né, e também ele é, pertence à, à diretoria do Drilling Simulator Zeller, da Universidade Tecnológica de Klausthal, na Alemanha. Ele tem interesse nas linhas de pesquisa relacionadas à tecnologia, simulação e automação de perfuração, perfuração direcional e integridade de poço. Né? E ele ministrará a palestra intitulada, né, Uh, geothermal Drilling Research na Universidade de Klausel, tá? So now, uh, I will give then a super short introduction to uh, Professor Opelt. Uh, Professor Opelt has obtained his PhD from Hanover University back in 1980. Uh, he had served for 33 years as a Director of Engineering Application at Baker Hughes in Tech in Celle, Germany, until 2015. Uh, he has been since professor at the TU Klausel and is now professor emeritus in high performance drilling and automation. And he belongs uh, to the board of drilling Simulator Zelle. Today, he will give the presentation entitled Geothermal Drilling Research at Klausel University of Technology. So please uh, welcome Professor Opelt. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much to uh, first to uh, Louis Hegeler, Professor Hegeler, and uh, also thank you very much to the SPE chapter at UDES University. I'm really excited to, to be able to speak in such, uh, let's say, international forum here. And for those of you who, who don't know that uh, Professor Hegeler, myself, and, and also my working group have been working together for, I guess, for the two years or so when uh, Professor Hegel stayed in, in, uh, in Celles. So a lot of the things that I will be presenting today will be sound, uh, will sound familiar to him, but maybe hopefully new and uh, interesting um, for you. So like, like uh, has been, been mentioned already, I will, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of the research that we are doing um, is around uh, geothermal drilling. And uh, you will understand in more detail uh, what this is all about in a few moments. So you see here my little table of contents. I will 
repeat something uh, about my CV, um, what, what uh, Professor Hegel already mentioned, but tell you a little bit more also with respect to why uh, and this, this professional career went like, like it did go. And then um, I will briefly explain the current uh, situation regarding geothermal energy in, in Germany. Um, then I will introduce Gloucester University um, a little bit uh, more in detail and specifically focus on these two organizations, Institute of Subsurface Energy Systems and uh, Drilling Simulator Cellar. And uh, the Drilling Simulator Cellar, by the way, is the organization uh, where Professor Hegel and, and myself uh, worked together for this period of time. Then the next uh, chapter, more, more or less the uh, central uh, focus here, will be on uh, what type of uh, drilling research are we doing uh, currently at these in these two organizations? And then, uh, okay, I have a brief summary and also a closing remark and uh, some recommendation. If that's okay for you, I will start now with uh, yeah my my diploma. I'm basically from uh, from education. Um, I have been working most of my professional career within the oil industry, but uh, like quite a few other people whom I have met and, and currently also cooperate with, uh, um, have a, a degree in uh, mechanical engineering. So I, I, I did, I, and I don't put any, any calendar years here to this uh, early uh, say parts of the career because it's long time ago in, in the previous century, but it's general mechanical engineering. And then uh, actually I started to work in a, a scientific research staff uh, position at um, at Hanover University um, on um, downstream uh, oil field, but downstream uh, subject. And the, the subject was called lubricating effectiveness of suspended solid lubricants in the presence of oil soluble uh, additives. So this was in, yeah, here's this, you see here, um, the number here, 1979. So it's uh, like 50 years ago, so or 40 years ago. So this basically the the subject here was uh, in a in a in a in a in a car you have uh, typically a gear and in the gear you have a gear lubricant uh, typically um, oil, mineral oil with some uh, some additives to improve the wear and uh, friction performance and uh, these are typically chemical additives but uh, you can also use uh, solid um, uh, lubricants like molybdenum disulfide or graphite. And these two uh, these two components interact with each other. So this was the subject uh, of my uh, dissertation in these uh, decades ago. And then, yeah, this this I did this work as a research assistant, as I mentioned. And the the institute was called Institute for Petroleum Research. So it's it's not uh, like like an oil drilling uh, um, upstream. It's downstream. It's uh, mineral oils for additives and uh, lubricants and things like that. And then this was for, let's say, five, four or five years, I guess, um, typical time. It takes also in our, let's say, in our area here to to um, go for the um, for the um, dissertation, for the PhD. And um, then afterwards, I had let something, let's say, outside all of this technology. I, was, I had been working with, the, I would say, Computer database and uh, the one major um, beta database on mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. And this was a, an organization in uh, in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. And then this was only for two years. And in, I think in 1982, I joined uh, this oil field service company, which is called Baker Hughes uh, nowadays. By the way, in, in these uh, old times, it's, uh, the company name was the original one was Christensen Diamond Products. So this, um, this is the company that um, traditionally developed uh, drill bits, diamond drill bits. And I believe and the, the company also today has been and still is uh, a, a leading company in this diamond bit technology. Actually, when when I joined the company, um, th there were only two two types of drill bits. One was the uh, was the impregnated drill bits for hard uh, rock drilling. And the other one uh, was um, the um, 
uh, with, with uh, larger cutters, uh, with the, the regular diamond drill bits. All, all these are fixed cutter bits, um, like oppositely to the tricomb bits, which are which roller cones. So in those days, Christian and Diamond products made only uh, only diamond drill bits, and um, they did that as an American company. It was headquartered in, in the United States, but uh, uh, was a, starting with a relatively small uh, location in Celle, Germany. Uh, they produced drill bits for the, the oil field in Germany and uh, neighboring countries. Now, meanwhile, they, so, um, during the 30 years, that uh, 30 plus, 33 years that I spent with that uh, oil field service company, and uh, the name changed, uh, the ownership changed a few times, and uh, the, the subject, the technology changed a lot. So and I will talk about... Uh, let's say the important things that happened there uh, a little bit later on. So this was the 33 years. And after that, I, during already the time at um, the last 10 years at Baker Hughes, I was already giving lectures at Klaus Stahl University because they, the university is always interested in having industry uh, lecturers um, who are, let's say, up to date uh, regarding new technology. And my, let's say, Key subject has always been and, and still is uh, directional drilling, and uh, this is this is not a by surprise because uh, the company in Germany, I mean the Baker Hughes in Germany, is a it's the um, the one global research center for for um, for for drilling for directional drilling MWD uh, LWD and uh, measuring devices uh, for for this company. Yeah, and as I said, I started the let's say the lecturer career. Um, about uh, 10, uh, now 15 years ago, and uh, the last five years from uh, from, 19, from 2015, 2016, I, I became the regular chair of uh, drilling and production department at the at the Cluster University at the Institute of Subsurface Energy Systems. So. Basically, my my uh, let's say lifetime uh, career was was finished when I when I finished the job with Baker Hughes. Uh, but so the, the last five years were kind of add on uh, after the regular retirement um, age in Germany, which is about uh, like sixty six years. And uh, yeah, so that's that's basically the. And so what I'm currently doing is, uh, as I said, I retired officially. Uh, it was mentioned I retired officially as the chair for drilling and production uh, last year in October, but I'm still overseeing uh, the um, uh, supervising um, ten, ten or twelve uh, actually uh, PhD, ten to twelve PhD candidates. Uh, I'm also giving uh, still lectures and. Um, Let's say one of my favorite um, 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 yeah, things to do is, is, is uh, organizing third party uh, funded um, um, development projects. So it's actually something uh, where I help a lot uh, with the university to find new projects and, and to organize these uh, projects. And I, I will talk about that also a bit, little bit later on, I guess. Uh, yeah, here's some uh, something, uh, some more details about what what we have been doing at the Institute for Petroleum uh, Research. As I mentioned, this is downstream, so the other side, and um, we did a we had a reasonably uh, a large laboratory there, and everything was about lubrication, uh, elastic hydrodynamics, for example, uh, is something, but uh, also. There was a big uh, motor test stand where um, motor oils uh, were tested and compared for also for companies, for manufacturers and uh, um, other companies. Um, you see what I did here. Um, I mean, I, the, the typical career at that institute, and I think it's still similar in other areas or other universities. Um, I, I was paid by some uh, by some. Um, yeah, by some project, a regular uh, salary, so to say, but uh, the actual work that had uh, to be done was not only for that one project, but also for other, uh, let's say, subjects. And uh, so this this uh, this resulted in a relatively broad overview in uh, in the field of uh, um, hydrodynamics, elastic um, uh, uh, hydrodynamics, and, and every, all kind of lubrication. And this is um, reflected by the by the list of uh, 
um, publications that were done with, uh, during these five years. So it's, I don't want to read through it. It's just uh, you see something about solid lubricants, um, scuffing behavior, iron beam technology were relatively at that time modern instruments that we use. So anyway, it's, it's about lubricants and, and um, more, uh, let's say, experimental, but also some, some uh, theoretical work. So this is now a little uh, some uh, ex more detailed explanation about uh, the Baker use. I, I started already saying that uh, in the beginning, this the subject that were um, handled there was basically diamond drill bits, coring uh, equipment, and then what we called uh, dump iron, a uh, dump iron technology like stabilizers, uh, drill collars, and shock uh, shock uh, shock shock subs. Um, uh, jars and things like that. So, yeah, I think mean, with something, it's it's really yeah, dump iron. A lot of heavy metal, a lot of uh, rubber uh, drilling motors were then coming into play, uh, but but no electronics. And uh, the really the, the game changing event uh, that occurred was in uh, 1980, um, uh, 88. Um, when there was a very big uh, project, a geo geological geoscience project uh, established in Germany, it was called Continental Deep Drilling Project, and you see here on the on the left hand side a picture of the drill rig. Um, this uh, they, they had actually they wanted to drill down to fifteen thousand meters at, at those days. It was let's say some some plan, but uh, they they ended then up uh, actually in. Um, like uh, 9,100 uh, meters, and what they, they they claimed that they had reached their goal because uh, they wanted to see the where the rock formation the 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 the, 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 de the depths where the rock formation changes from uh, from the from the hard uh, uh, phase into into the uh, what is it called flexible elastic phase. Um, so that that was achieved. Um, so now why why I'm not talking about this because um, um, a lot of apart from the ge geoscience that was involved there, a lot of technical research had to be done and this this was a project uh, I don't know five hundred million dollars in total now I would say where the the German government the federal government invested into this and there was part of the money was going to the ge geoscience people and part of the money was going into a technical people and Baker Hughes, which had a different company name at that time, was uh, receiving and performing a lot of uh, research projects. Um, and these research projects were focused on one aim. Uh, in order to make the hole as deep as possible, you would like to reduce the friction, torque and drag and friction in the borehole as much as possible. And this can be best established if you, if you have a truly vertical borehole and um, so what we what we did that and that I was related with this uh, KTB Continental Deep Drilling Project uh, all the time or leading that project in Baker Hughes. And at that time we developed uh, the first tool that is in the, the upper piece there, 19, uh, first oil field computerized automated steering system that was um, done and uh, finished or uh, working in 1990. And that system could automatically steer the, the well in a, in a vertical Trade uh, uh, profile. We had some different uh, generations of tools. Uh, we called it basically we called it vertical drilling system. And what it did was uh, it was detecting um, any any deviation from the actual vertical with with uh, accelerometers. And uh, these acceler and any deviation that occurred resulted in a, in a movement of hydraulic rips, which which were uh, touching or pressing against uh, the borehole wall and keeping the pushing the, the tool to the side in, in the required direction. And by this way, it was um, um, uh, yeah, resulting in, in a producing a very straight hole and which allowed them to get, go to this uh, absolute deep uh, uh, target. Um, yeah, so I don't want to, to go into more, more, more details about that, but this was step number one. And then after KTB was finished, um, also within my group, the, the first uh, globally first rotary steerable system uh, was developed. That is in the lower part of the hole. Uh, this uh, system is called Autotruck. 
um, and, and Baker Youth at that time was the first company to put you to market uh, such a system. And the rotary steel system, as most probably everybody knows, is, is able to drill any desired um, trajectory in whatever uh, environment and situation. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, this KTP project starting in 1990 about was, was the one uh, when, at least for our company, but I think also for others, uh, when uh, about those times when really um, electronics were introduced in, uh, in, um, in, in the drilling industry. And, and, uh, and uh, nowadays, when, when you talk to people at my previous company, basically the, the software is it's another generation now. The, the appropriate software makes a difference in terms of, uh, let's say, performance and also economic um, uh, results. Right, and also, let's say, my, my tendency to, towards directional drilling uh, started within these days uh, at Baker Hughes. And now I want to uh, talk a little bit about this uh, little village of Klausthal Zellerfeld you may see on the on the right hand side you see the uh, on the left side you see this uh, map of, of Germany you will see it, by the way also in one of the next slides this from north uh, to south and um, you see this red uh, red dot there this is really in the center of Germany um, uh, you can't see it more maybe in detail the red, the red dot is supposed to be uh, the location of Zelle and the uh, above that you see uh, some some uh, white point uh, that's that's Hanover. Um, everything in northern Germany, all all the um, north of uh, let's say north of uh, of Klausthal is the is, is the, the oil and gas area in in Germany. So we have very little uh, uh, reservoirs outside or to the south there are some but but really minor so everything all, all, all oil gas is in the, the northern part but i don't want to talk about uh, oil and gas um klaus is uh, um, located in some medium high uh, mountains hearts called hearts mountains uh, like not very high but 600 meter and um, it's very small like you see here 15,000 uh, people more or less living there and the, the number of students is uh, like 5,000. The, the reason, uh, what is, what is uh, why is it there? Uh, uh, there have been for hundreds of years uh, minerals uh, like um, silver and some other things uh, were uh, harvested uh, within the, the Harz Mountain. So it's this former, formerly it was a mining town. Now you can call it a university town but because there is no longer any any um, silver or things uh, mined in there well, as you see here it's it's uh, quite old as a tradition like uh, in the 18th century it was a mining school on a let's say lower level than in the 19th century some some uh, it was called royal mining academy so it, it reputation developed over the years until uh, in the 1970s or 1968 it was uh, uh, let's say um, uh, trans transformed into a technical university, Klaustral University of Technology, which means um, the mining uh, and is, is one part of it. But we have uh, nowadays we have also economics um, and some other uh, sciences, electric electronics, electrics, uh, mechanical engineering, things like that. Traditionally, it's a mining university, but uh, a lot of things uh, are changing uh, these days. Yeah, before I, I talk to about, about, I will talk later uh, about the, the Institute uh, of, um, of Subsurface Energy Systems and, and the uh, Drilling Simulator. But before that, I'm, I mean, the subject here, or let's say the over, over leading subject is geothermal energy. And uh, again, you see here the map of, um, of Germany, um, two or three actually here. On the left hand side, um, you see basically a, a gray gray uh, area and then green there are two different depths like one slow, uh, i think is 1000 meter depths and the yeah, this on the right one is 3000 meter depths and the, the rots, red spots uh, basically uh, represent uh, the the temperature anomalies uh, that we have in, in in germany 
and um, a green is, uh, I mean, red is uh, more, uh, hotter than, uh, than, than yellow, and yellow is hotter than green, uh, obviously. But what I want uh, to, to share with you is also that, uh, again, the northern Germany basin is uh, also shown on the, on the right-hand side on the slide. North German basin is, um, is a major, uh, I have to say, resource or even uh, at least potential resource for, for, um, for geothermal energy harvesting. And uh, then you see two other areas. Um, the lower part, uh, the so-called Upper Rheingraben and Southern German Molasse Basin. These are uh, two um, geothermal, uh, two, two, two areas with geothermal anomalies. Anomalies, I mean, this, these are areas where the, the temperature coefficient is, is higher than three degrees per hundred meters, so which, which allows to, to produce uh, better heat than uh, in, in any other area. So the Unfortunately, I have to say that uh, the let's say the geothermal activity is still uh, relatively small in Germany um, compared to let's say the potential uh, that we have there. Uh, but uh, this, this is um, because currently, I mean, talking about let's say alternative energies, we have uh, most popular in Germany are uh, geo uh, are wind uh, wind power and um, and solar power by far. Um, but I mean, there is this, let's say, a, 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 a fraction of people, of organizations, also government-wise, that are supporting um, the geothermal energy. And um, the the most active, um, let's say, area these days is the, the Southern German uh, Molasse Basin, because. Um, First of all, they have a very high temperature anomaly, which is which is good for for the um, for temperature for for geothermal energy production. And secondly, which is at least uh, maybe even more important, is they have this this cast castus um, um, geology, where the where the really large volumes of of uh, water of hot water are more or less freely uh, floating uh, below the surface. So the the wells there are down to average, like say, uh, three thousand meters, um, and, and temperatures are sometimes between 150 and 160 degrees Celsius. So the this is uh, the Munich area, uh, and uh, the the, uh, the the administration there, the the the, the power suppliers in, in, in the Munich area are the most active ones and. Uh, most of all the geothermal activity currently is occurring uh, in, in that area. And um, let's say from traditionally, I mean, the last, uh, let's say when this geothermal thing started, maybe 15 years ago, uh, there was a lot of uh, focus on uh, producing uh, uh, um, geothermal energy for heating purposes, but also for electricity. And um, recently, this is uh, let's say this, this thing has uh, changed a little bit. So people are more looking now uh, just to to go with um, uh, geothermal uh, heating for 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 heating supply of of houses or for uh, greenhouses or uh, other companies or facilities. Um, but all the but when I say ge, by the way when I say geothermal I always mean deep geothermal which means like deeper than one thousand meters. Um, so um, let's say our focus is here. We have in, in Germany we have different universities who are also dealing with uh, this um, uh, geothermal research, geothermal drilling research, partially also, but I think in. With, with respect to drilling, um, Cluster University is for sure the, the most active and uh, uh, competent one. And our focus is, let's say, it's for whole Germany, it's also for global applications, but uh, there's some special focus on the North German basin, uh, because it, it is compared to the South uh, completely, let's say, underdeveloped and there are special um, uh, challenges there in northern Germany, like uh, we drill a, a lot of salt, and um, 
in unstable formations and in, in the deeper depths, we, we also encounter hard rock drilling, which is a special interest uh, for our uh, organizations in Klausdal and in, and in Celle. So this is what I wanted to tell you about uh, German, uh, uh, the German situation regarding geothermal energy. And we had just this morning, I had a, a discussion with uh, representatives from the government. So there seems to be um, currently, because Germany really wants to go uh, for green energies, um, there seems to be a, a big move also to supporting uh, geothermal energy research uh, even more than it has been done before. So we have good chances to acquire um, a third party, i.e. government uh, funding for our research work. So this is now about, after talking so many times about the Institute, it's called Institute of Subsurface Energy Systems in Klaus Zellerfeld. Uh, it's also the acronym is ITE, which has nothing to do with the not new name or the current name that we have. What you see there is uh, yeah, on the left hand side a little bit uh, picture of the area. You see some some uh, woods in the in the back, and on the right hand side, more importantly, you see the comp uh, the uh, company, the uh, the institute building, um, and also you see a rig there, which is uh, not a working rig, but it's uh, it's called a must. Um, it has been very popular in, in Germany and. In the 60s, uh, I guess, um, and, and partially also in the 70s. And by the way, also one of the continental deep drilling wells. There were in total two wells. One of these wells was also drilled with this, with this AMOS. So this is landmark. And uh, at the opportunity of of my last um, birthday um, event, I had to climb this must. So it, it is possible. I was up in the Dr. Hegel, when you are next time in Germany, you have to climb up to the to the wheel there in the in the, in the, in the top of the of the Amos. And so these, these tubes are, tubes are hollow, and you can climb up uh, uh, mechanically, so to say. This this must. So it's the building is relatively um, let's let's say yeah, yeah, enjoy it. I mean, I can recommend it. Um, the building is, we have lecture halls, we have offices, laboratories, testing facilities. I, I cannot touch everything and I don't want to do it. Just uh, there are two big uh, departments. One is on the right hand side, uh, the one for, for reservoir engineering. And the, the, um, the car, on the left hand side, you see the drilling and production um, uh, department. Um, this is the drilling production department was, so to say, used to be mine, which is now headed by, by Professor Jäger. And Professor Ganser is, is still there. We, in our department, just to give you an impression, in our department, we, we, we do have about uh, 20 employees. Um, and these employees mostly is research staff and, um, and also a big uh, uh, a major group uh, that is working mechanically um, um, in the workshop. Well, you see here um, a picture which I would like hopefully demonstrate to you that um, this, um, you see the, the workshop there is, let's say, famous and very competent for, for uh, all country tubular goods testing. Uh, so there's a make up and a test center. And uh, we are not only doing, um, let's say, research on, on oil field connections, but we are also a provider of services to, um, to manufacturers of tubulars, um, casings, whatever type of tubulars, mostly metal. Nowadays, also um, fiber, uh, carbon fiber and reinforced uh, plastic tubes, uh, so which are used for uh, geothermal application in, in some cases. Um, uh, there's a actually a research uh, project ongoing, but everything typically everything is very heavy. And, and let's say we we are doing research, as I said, but we are also providing uh, professional services to companies in uh, yeah globally um, uh, yeah everywhere in Europe, but but also in uh, South America, partially Argentina and uh, other places. <clears throat> Now, this, this, this is one center, and this, this uh, institute is, as I said, is in the, at the location of the university in the, the Harz Mountains in Klausthal, and about 100 kilometers uh, north of, uh, 120 kilometers north of uh, 
of uh, Clausthal and, and about 50 kilometers uh, north of Hanover, we have this uh, little town called Celle, and uh, that is where basically Clausthal University had this off-site location, off-site uh, research center, which is called German Center for High Performance Drilling and Automation, or Drilling Simulator Celle. And Celle, just one uh, comment about this, Celle is, is, has, <coughs> has been and it still is the, the center <coughs> of uh, the oil center. The little used, we call it sometimes the little Texas, Texas in Germany. Um, so what what are we doing there? So um, we, we, the center is relatively, let's say, small compared to uh, the institute in Cluster. We have let's say about uh, twelve people uh, there, and the justification um, why we are what we are basically ultimately aiming is to reduce the drilling costs and uh, in, increasing safety. Um, so let's say smart uh, ahead uh, simulation of the drilling process. The reason why it is in Germany, uh, in Germany, no. Uh, what the reason why it is in Celle is actually because we are also uh, um, let's say encouraged uh, to cooperate with the oil industry. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, most of the the German oil and gas and also geothermal industry now is located uh, in or around uh, the area of, of Celle. Some of our special interests uh, are uh, fluid dynamics, and this also sometimes depending on the people who are working there. But fluid dynamics is uh, um, is one of our interests. Uh, temperature dynamics is also related to this, of course, a lot. Uh, drilling dynamics, uh, hard rock drilling, and and geothermal, let's say, application. And we uh, we are also yeah we are not only doing research, let's say, by ourselves there, but we we offer um, the, the simulators uh, there for, for training uh, people of third parties um, so that they can uh, save um, uh, say actual rig time by doing the, the test, the, the, the training in, in that location. So the, the concept that we have is um, we are simulating, uh, we are trying to simulate uh, reality as best as possible. And uh, what we are basically doing, you see here the picture of a typical um, drill rig uh, with all the related um, installations. What we are doing is we are cutting free this uh, the lowest uh, part, lower part of the drill thing, like like 20, uh, 20 meters. And uh, uh, these twenty meters we put uh, in, into something which we call our hardware simulator. And um, <clears throat> The rest of this is what whatever is normally above the drill thing. It's, it's uh, simulated uh, through actuators that we have in our test machine and it, and by the appropriate software that is controlling uh, the actuators. So the the idea is that these twenty meters uh, that we have actually in the, in the test uh, machine that these uh, twenty meters feel as if they were drilling below a five thousand meter uh, drill thing. So yeah, we have we have the hardware in in the laboratory, and we have the software that operates the the controllers and the uh, in the hardware. Um, yeah, drill string vibrations is a major subject that we. And I show you the picture of that uh, hardware simulator in the middle. The um, the 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 experiments that we do there are not uh, very often. Um, um, about the, the, the drill string vibrations, which because as you as everybody knows, uh, drilling vibrations are not most cases not really uh, desired and uh, dangerous to the drill string and uh, to the equipment and to the borehole. We look into faults and rock types and uh, things like that, but again, mostly under the overall subject of uh, drill string dynamics. Um, yeah, this is this is a picture of the uh, say uh, artist impression of the of the machine. You see on the on the lower part, you see uh, on the right hand side something which is called uh, Gesteinskammer or rock chamber, which is a five uh, meter long um, uh, compartment, uh, and inside that you see we have um, rock formation, so the, the sample so to say. And then from uh, from the left hand side you see this motor, 
uh, which where you, we have a rotated uh, tube, like a drilling drill pipe, and uh, the, this tube drills. There's a ceiling in the middle of the picture, and in the red the red pipe basically uh, represents the the borehole or the casing, if you want. So, so we have um, we have this is uh, all equipped with uh, regular oil field pumps. I think on the next picture you see uh, you see. Um, um, a realistic picture of that. Uh, so on the right hand side, in this case, we have the drilling machine uh, with uh, the, you see the the black tube uh, hose uh, feeding the the, the fluid and in, into this. So we can pump up to three thousand liters per minute. We can put uh, like uh, 25, 26 uh, tons uh, weight on bit. The, the bit size is eight and a three quarter. So this is full scale testing again, and. Um, yeah, we have um, like some uh, 100 bar annular pressure. So the, what we try to do is to keep this, um, to have these uh, the operating parameters as um, realistic as possible. And this is this red motor sledge is, is let's say moving from right to the left. And on the, we have this uh, the chamber. This is the uh, Operational equipment is within our uh, workshop, and outside uh, we have the the actual the, um, the, 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 the rock chamber and uh, the annulus. Um, so when I say we we want to keep this as um, as realistic as possible, uh, we realized at one point that uh, this drilling machine is uh, let's say a relatively stiff thing so we have this 25 meters of bha and uh, we are um, when we when we rotate and when we uh, when we uh, put the weight on bit uh, basically the the yeah, the feeding uh, uh, feeding uh, members are uh, quite stiff whereas in reality uh, the the uh, 5000 or even 3000 meters long drill string is relatively flexible and elastic and we wanted to let's say overcome this this limitation, which uh, which we um, try to do with uh, let's say modification uh, to the um, uh, to the existing test. And actually, what you see here is, uh, and uh, I think Professor Hegel has not seen that yet because it has been finished only let's say one month ago um, or even less. Uh, what you see here is a completely uh, modified or new device. Uh, which was very expensive, I can tell you, which was done um, within a third party or government funded um, a research project. So what we can do now is we have elasticity in two dimensions, so that is in axial direction and in the rotational and torsional uh, direction. So we can now, we can apply uh, axial uh, uh, dynamics as well as uh, torsional dynamics and, and but what we really want to do is when we when we do a, a drill test, we want to allow the <clears throat> uh, the, sam uh, the the drilling sample, I mean the the, the BHA, to behave uh, as if it were in a in a three thousand meter long under a three thousand meter long uh, horizontal drill string. So uh, we we do not want to we will not put uh, let's say dynamic uh, um, motions onto the drill string, but we will allow to, uh, the, the, the drill string, the BHA, to to, to move, uh, let's say, freely. And one part of the enhancement is also this um, this rock chamber. Until now, the, the, the rock chamber that we used were under atmospheric pressure, so we had just uh, the, the, the fluid enter in, in, in a, uh, into the drill string, then exit at the drill bit, and then go into the annulus. Uh, what we can do now is with this um, enhanced, modified, and very huge and, and heavy um, rock chamber, we can apply um, um, external pressure onto the onto the side of the of the of the rock, and also we can heat it up so we can make a temperature. Experiments. So this is also part of the the new uh, uh, situation. And now moving uh, a bit to the um, to the software side. So what we have uh, as a base installment there is something which is called Drillsim 600 from a from a supplier called uh, Drilling Systems in um, in South England, which is typically used as a training uh, training device for for rig. Uh, for rig crews, for rig crews, 
in order to to learn uh, the, the surface installations uh, like moving the derrick and things like that and also the uh, the low out control uh, uh, scenarios but what we do instead is we are we have the ability here to to um, implement our own software because this thing typically is not not very realistic in terms of the downhole software. So what we are doing here is we, we, um, we implement new software. We are also cooperating with that company in a current research project. And the, the idea is that um, we will be able, we are, we are getting closer to that uh, goal. We, we will be able to do really realistic scenario drilling. In other words, uh, be able to drill a rig on paper or um, can use this as a um, um, the uh, yeah, digital twin, if you want to say, kind kind of, so that uh, um, operators who are going to have plans to drill uh, wells can get recommendations how to, let's say, optimize uh, operating parameters or change uh, directions or change equipment or things like that. And uh, the justification to do this under the uh, geothermal scenario is that uh, typically uh, other than the differently from the oil industry, geothermal industry is, is not so educated and doesn't have that much experience because uh, geothermal applications are relatively unique these days, at least uh, in Germany. I mean, there are some exceptions uh, uh, globally, but uh, so we, we want to, to help also the geothermal industry. And that's why the government is also paying um, research work in, in this direction. Yeah, uh, we see here some examples, uh, some descriptions, verbal descriptions of what we do uh, um, in terms of uh, simulation, uh, software research, um, cutting transportation is something which, um, and that is that goes also beyond the this this uh, drill in six hundred. But we were also doing, uh, let's say, simulation and research work that is not directly or automatically related to the drill in six hundred. But uh, we, some, uh, I don't know whether this is really not mentioned here on this picture, what is currently uh, gaining a lot of interest, uh, and this, uh, and Professor Hegelin knows what I'm talking about, what is gaining a lot of interest uh, recently is um, here in uh, northern Germany is the, um, the, um, uh, the, the temperature behavior uh, in, in uh, geothermal wells. Um, Let's say uh, typical geo, uh, geothermal world, but especially also suns, uh, geothermal suns. So we are in discussion there, and so it's this. Um, yeah, this is what we are doing about uh, simulation. And now, getting a little bit closer to to my um, to the end of my presentation, I guess I, I also have to. I will talk a little bit about uh, about ongoing uh, re geothermal related drilling research projects so the, you you see on the on the left hand side the acronyms which are all starting with o and the o always means optimization um, so this is obs is obe there's obh um, obs is actually the thing where we use the, these modified new um, uh, hardware simulator for well, what we are doing is when you, when you drill for geothermal in hard rock, uh, you're typically looking for, for, for cracks because in these cracks, you can, you can have some circulation of, of water, things like that, but the, the finding drilling into cracks is not good for the drilling process. So what we are, what we are in, investigating and researching is what happens to the drilling dynamics if the drill bit enters into such uh, disturbed uh, rock formation. So this is more or less the scientific uh, justification or content of the OBS. Uh, the OBE is <clears throat> basically um, enabling this software simulator, which I showed you to be uh, say more or less uh, as much as possible, as best as possible, an, an ideal uh, a digital, digital twin for, for um, for a drilling operation uh, in, in geothermal wells. The OBH is about hammer drilling. I will, I will put a few comments on that uh, on the next slide. Um, Geotwin is, um, is also related to this uh, digital, digital twin uh, subject. There's so some, uh, let's say, smaller projects from the, from the um, Lower Saxony state government, Niedersachsen state government. Niedersachsen is one of the 16 uh, federal uh, states that we have in uh, in Germany. So it's, um, 
uh, one of the larger ones, and that this is our our this, our university, by the way, is also a, a state university owned or, or run by Niedersachsen uh, State. Um, cement Integrity um, Winter Saldea is, is a, a interesting project that we are doing at uh, Cluster University at the Institute uh, at ITE, where we research the influence of, um, we are looking for optimizing the integrity of the cement by um, influencing uh, vibrations into the, 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 the still liquid uh, uh, cement. And uh, this little acronym like CSYS is uh, about um, a, a smaller project, um, about three years long project um, and that, that is about a hard coating of, um, of um, connections of, of uh, oil country, uh, oil tubulars. Um, with uh, not using a liquid lubricant, but uh, a sprayed uh, components. I forgot one uh, one project here to mention, but I, uh, I, uh, on this on the slide, but I will mention it in this way uh, uh, verbally. We have something called Gregeo, whatever that means, but uh, it is a project where we participate in a collaboration project where we investigate. Um, the uh, behavior of fiber carbon reinforced uh, plastic tubes for for uh, production uh, and for casing also for casing tubes in geothermal wells. This uh, is currently gaining a lot of interest uh, in Germany in order to have a better isolation between the producing and the, the hot fluid and the, the cold fluid. This is uh, another one which I, I didn't put on the slide. Uh, going to the hammer project, uh, as you see here, I don't know whether this thing will be working. Well, I don't know whether you have seen uh, or heard the sound of this, but what, it, what you see here is a small scale hammer experiment. Well, basically, what we are developing is a mud driven uh, hammer. There are hammers all around uh, that are working with, uh, with air, but uh, there's none existing which is really reliably working with mud. Some are doing that with water, but we are uh, developing here a, um, a mud driven hammer. And uh, now uh, this is some example we are doing within this research. We are doing a lot of simulation. You see here some example of the the, um, the position of this hammer, this moving hammer, which is done with with MATLAB Simulink uh, software. So we are also using this, or we are specifically using the simulation in order to save uh, some experimental time. Um, yeah, this this brings me actually. To the end of my my presentation, uh, I, I can, from my history and from my, um, what, what also what we are doing today, what I'm still involved in, uh, we are doing a, a lot of um, exciting work, and uh, um, so uh, this keeps me busy uh, also beyond my regular retirement, and. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that uh, I could give you some, uh, let's say, indication of why this is the case. One other thing which I wanted to mention, uh, Professor Hegel and I very uh, intensively fought for a collaboration agreement, which has been established between uh, UDESC and ITE uh, slash uh, TU Cluster, um, which, which allows to exchange uh, scientific staff and, and to collaborate research and uh, things like that. So. I hope that in the future we can uh, we can bring this uh, even more to life than it has been in the past. But but one example is that Professor Hegel is uh, as an advisor very very active and and um, as an advisor for one of my PhD candidates, and he he knows whom I'm talking about. One other thing I wanted to let's say um, a challenge here is uh, I mean I first uh, in my life of course uh, presented something to uh, in SPE chapter um, 
in Brasil. And, and we have also an, an SPE chapter at, at TU Cluster, University of Cluster. So what you may want to consider is to go into contact with this uh, SPE chapter here in, in Cluster, and maybe you can do certain things together. I don't know. So that's I'm finished. I'm done. I was a little bit scared in the last uh, time that I wouldn't would would go beyond my allowed time, but I think I made it right. So whatever you made it. question. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Professor Opel, for your very interesting presentation. And I think we have time for some questions. Uh, okay, I think we already have like uh, two questions. Uh, so I will begin with the first one. Uh, let me see if I can get, yeah, sure. So uh, a question for from Janaini Martins. Uh, what are the main advantages of geothermal energy uh, regarding other renewable resources like wind and solar energy? And yes, thanks, thanks very much. Very, very good question, but also uh, I appreciate to be uh, to be able to answer that. The, the big, uh, the major advantage of, of geothermal energy uh, uh, above these two other energies mentioned is that uh, the energy is a continuous and stable energy supply. Uh, wind and solar, as everybody knows, sometimes the wind is going, sometimes not. Uh, sunshine, we have sometimes in Germany, not so often as maybe in Brazil. But um, so, yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a Geothermal energy can 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 act as a base energy because it's it's always there for let's say thirty years or so, and um, the other thing is um, geothermal energy. This is not only a one-way direction. We can use uh, geothermal energy not only let's say for producing the heat from the underground, but we can also um, let's say use it for for storing heat. So when, for example, when when you generate a lot of energy. With solar and uh, and uh, and wind, uh, the more energy than you can you can utilize uh, for for uh, any application. You can store that over 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 energy. This overestimated energy, this oversized energy, you can store it into the ground, then reproduce it at, at times when the, the wind is not going. Oops. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, we also have another question uh, by Tainara Gonçalves. Uh, do you think, uh, do you think, do you consider geothermal energy uh, the main alternative for the energy transition? No, I, honestly, I have to admit, uh, I don't think so, that it will be the the principal and main, at least not in our area, not under the circumstances, the environmental, uh, geological situation that we have here in, in Central Europe. Uh, I don't think it will, but it will have. Uh, it's. I think it has nowadays the the the, the share in Germany for for geothermal energy is maybe less than one percent or whatever um, uh, of of the renewables, but. Uh, it will be, it will change to maybe maybe ten percent or something between up to ten percent and but the the wind as I, and I see it here in, in 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 the really northern part of northern Germany everything is full of windmills and we what we're basically doing in Germany is um, generating all the electricity in in northern Germany and building new uh, um, electrical lines from from northern Germany uh, to southern Germany which is a major event because. In southern Germany doesn't have the wind and also doesn't have that much uh, solar uh, potential. So we are producing the, the electrical energy in Germany and transporting it to, to new power lines, which is very difficult and costly to, to establish uh, from northern and to German, uh, southern part of Germany. So I don't think it will be a base energy, but it will, it will be a, a stable, uh, it will be a stable base energy, but it will not be the major uh, energy provider. Okay, so we still have a couple of questions here. Uh, here's one question from Silvia Maria Asusena. Uh, can you tell us about the projects on cement integrity? 
Do, yeah, do, the, do the, current project that we, the current project that we are undertaking with uh, with some uh, major, with the major major German uh, um, oil company or energy company Winters Idea is basically that we it's about plug and abandonment mostly because this is a, is a current uh, subject in in uh, globally I think for all the mature fields and so forth. So what we are what they are trying to in investigate with us together is um, how can we make the uh, how can we improve the the, the the ceiling behavior of the cement in a, in, a, this, uh, in the cement plug situation by uh, by shaking the cement with uh, with some uh, uh, vibrator let's say what you're doing but before the cement is cured uh, there's a vibrator lowered into the cement and the but the Cement is shaking, and then what we are doing currently in the laboratory is comparing the uh, the, the, yeah, the the behavior, also the the the, the glue, you know, what is it, the frictional behavior of the cement against the, the casing and the metal, and and the, the tightness of the of the cement itself, and the physical properties, how they change uh, under the influence of the, the vibration, and we do that. Um, we do that on atmospheric pressure first, but also we, we put it into a, a pressurized chamber in order to, let's say, um, have more realistic environmental conditions for borehole. Okay. Uh, so we still have uh, one more question to go uh, from Joanna Miller. Uh, professor, can you tell us about uh, well control automation well, if you're talking if I'm not sure about uh, what I understand the question but if you talk really about well control you mean uh, um, safety uh, safety uh, appliances and things like that this, this is a uh, this is not the subject that let's say my department or our group is uh, is dealing with so this is um, part of the um, uh, surface installations and yeah, it, theoretically, it should be part of our, um, let's say, uh, of our of our research, of our subject, of our field. But we are we are not doing uh, anything in that uh, thing. What we are when we are what we are doing in terms of automation is that we are doing uh, automation uh, downhole uh, processes, um, uh, things like that. Um, we also we we can um, at the drilling simulator cellar. We we also have the opportunity. When people have, let's say, their automation uh, software for for trajectory drilling, we are we are we, we can uh, testing those boxes in our simulated environments. But I think well control automation we we don't have. Okay. Uh, we still have one last question. Uh, what's what's the main why are you using uh, directional drilling in geothermal uh, energy? Uh, I, I could talk about that uh, for, for hours, but uh, I mean, just to make a quick uh, response is that, uh, I mean, there used to be, uh, let's say, um, uh, anticipa anticipation that uh, a geothermal well is a vertical well or two vertical wells, which, which are then connected by the reservoir. But it's... Uh, I think nowadays people believe, and I, I for sure do that, that it's better to have uh, a, a horizontal wells uh, where, you, where you have the two horizontal wells that are, let's say, where the interaction is between the horizontal arms of these wells. So in, in more and more people are, are planning and, and doing that also a lot in, uh, in, the, I know in the area, in the Munich area and the Molasse Basin. Do you have a better heat exchange if you have uh, deviated wells? Okay. It's, it's also one, if I may add, there's one concept called EVA, E A V O R, where some guy or some company um, is talking about drilling uh, several lateral wells, uh, like 10 or 20 next to each other, in order to harvest the energy more efficiently. So, yeah, directional drilling is a very, very important thing for geothermal. Yeah, sure. Uh... We have a question for from uh, the student chapter. Uh, any any student? Uh, do you have any? Uh, are you studying at ITE or DSC about any alternative uh, to cement 
like an example, uh, calcium carbonates. We, we have discussed about that. I, I, I know about these activities, but we are currently not actively following that. I think it would be interesting to do a project on that subject, but currently it's not done. So I would be looking forward to, let's say, a project proposal on that. Okay, okay. So, uh, so we have, we don't have any more questions. Uh, so I also would like to uh, give some final words on this. Uh, uh, and yes, we have, uh, like Professor Opel have sa has said uh, in the end of his lecture, that we have struggled a lot about getting our institutions together in an agreement. And yes, uh, we have done so. Now we, so now we have a, a collaboration agreement, uh, and this uh, we we will have the intention to bring life to this collaboration uh, very soon. I think so. Uh, let's let's try to do that. And we are also in touch with the SPE chapter from uh, to Klaus to uh, uh, We're still trying to contact them. Uh, but uh, I will uh, carbon copy you in some next emails. Let's see. And I will add now. Uh, and if you have any, any uh, more words to say, Professor, please, uh, you, you can do it. No, OK. I Basically, I, I, start, uh, I finish as I started. I, I appreciated the opportunity uh, to, to do this, so let's say, international uh, presentation, especially to a country where, uh, where we had a very uh, friendly and uh, helpful um, co-worker for a time being at Drilling Simulator Zelle. And um, yeah, following also what Professor Hegeler says, I would I would really encourage to use the, the existing tools like the, the collaboration agreement and the a joint uh, participation in SPE for the student chapters uh, to, to do some things together. It um, would be really nice. And if you need help okay, on this, from the much. student chapter size, the, 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 the chief of the student chapter in, in Cluster is a, one of my PhD candidates. So if you need any, any help or encouragement from my side, I mean, uh, we can do that. If you don't get a rea instantaneous okay. reaction. So if you okay. need something from me, please let me know. Okay, thanks very much again. And so, and. Uh, Thank you. I now uh, let uh, Rafaela get get back on the common uh, for this lecture. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks everyone. I want to thank you again, Professor Dr. Alpelt, and our sponsor for this lecture. Uh, that was really interesting subjects to discuss. Uh, as also the partnership between our two universities, as well the the contact between our chapters, I think it's very important for disseminating knowledge and approximate um, the students and the researchers. Um, so again, thank you everyone that is still here with us. Now I'm gonna say uh, some uh, Portuguese um details uh, gente vocês sabem que o workshop está chegando então as inscrições podem ser feitas né só podem ser feitas pelo nosso site spldesk.com.br é, lá você pode se inscrever Ter acesso à distribuição.